16 will be a good text to have as a general a general effect or let's just use the point of inspiration itself john 5 39 john 5 39 so there are many things to learn under this um, conversation so many things to discover so many things to realize we'll start from a very interesting point tonight and then we'll unfold in other weeks as god will give us inspiration and utterance. hallelujah Hallelujah. Amen. So he says, search the scripture. And the word search here is a very interesting term. <laughs> uh, one of the things it connotes is investigate the scriptures. <laughs> For in them, that is in the scriptures, you think that you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. So this is Jesus speaking, encouraging the investigation of the scriptures um, did you drop your volume i need a bit i need it to be a little bit lower search the scriptures for in them that is in the scriptures you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me hallelujah Amen. i said hallelujah Amen. what we are considering today is titled the canon of scriptures um it's a very interesting perspective and a little bit historical also so we might just have some reminders of what happened in the early church history yes and also make progress with respect to how it applies to the current state of things so we are discussing the canon of scriptures let us quickly pray Holy Spirit, give us understanding all through this conversation in Jesus' name. Let the word of God come alive in our hearts. Let the word burn in our hearts. In Jesus' name, we pray. The canon of scriptures. I believe that every serious-minded Christian agrees that the Bible is central to Christianity. The Bible is central to Christianity. I don't want to believe that the people listening to me right now can say things like, let us forget the Bible. Let us leave Bible aside. If you're a Christian, <laughs> one way to describe a serious Christian is a Bible-believing Christian. Not just a Bible-believing Christian, a Bible-practicing Christian. A Bible-principled um, Christian. The Bible is central to Christianity. Everything we claim, everything, everything we do, everything we believe in the Christian faith is based on what the Bible says. If somebody asks you, why are you not in support of homosexuality? Your first answer should not be, oh, it's disgusting. Your first answer as a, as a Christian should be, the Bible does not support it. Somebody asks you, What's wrong with speaking, I mean, ill about church authority or speaking evil about even governmental authority? The first answer should be the Bible does not support it. Somebody asks you what is wrong with Yahoo Yahoo and swindling people of their money and every kind of theft and criminality. Your first answer should be the Bible does not support it. So everything that we believe and practice in the Christian faith is founded in scriptures. The phrase, it is written, it's not just a defensive mechanism against Satan's attack. It's um, a principle that guides our life. It is written. Why are you doing that thing? It is written. Why don't you believe this stuff? It is written. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at it in John chapter 6 and verse 45. A couple of it is written emphasis here. And interestingly, it's Jesus that is saying these things. Now, you know, we are saying Jesus paid so much respect or so much, gave so much respect to scriptures that even to justify his own beliefs, his own practices, he said, it is written. He didn't say, well, I am Jesus, I can do everything, I can do anything. Jesus himself said, 
it is written. So, in John chapter 8 and verse 17, you see the same sentiment. Jesus quoting, it is also written in your law. Now, he calls it in your law, but basically, it was affirming that there is a testimony or a witness that justifies what he is doing. He calls it in your law, but in actuality, it is the law of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So, in justifying certain actions, Jesus quoted and said, it is written. John chapter 10 and verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are God. Now, who can recollect where this particular verse is in the Old Covenant or Old Testament? What book of the Bible? It's in Psalms. So when Jesus said, Is it not written in your law? That phrase, in your law, is um, a relative statement. Because we have the prophets, we have the law, we have the Psalms. But when it says, Is it not written in your law? Is describing the general Old Testament. Amen. Amen. And although it says in your law, it's actually referring to the scripture, what is referred to as the word of God in the context of the Old Testament. But the point here is this. Jesus didn't just go about saying, I am Jesus and everything I do is correct. Anytime he was confronted by the Pharisees and he was argued against, what he said was, it is written. It is written. So, that simply means that we as believers have to put respect to the scriptures and we have to have and it is written for every action every belief every practice as a christian don't say my church believes that's a very um that's that's not a nice thing to say don't say my pastor said that that's not a nice thing to say always learn to say it is written hallelujah Amen. why do you Wear trousers as a lady. It is written. So go and look for the it is written. Uh, yeah. Because somebody's going to quote the scriptures too to antagonize what you are doing. So in the day somebody is quoting it is written, they're going to say, my pastor said, that would be an embarrassment to me. Amen. Why don't you cover air in church? It is written. Ha. Because somebody will quote it is written to also say, you should cover air. Whether air or head, depending on the person's understanding. <laughs> so get your it is written as bullets ready. Anytime somebody demands why you are doing what you are doing, let it be an it is written. Un authentic Christianity is biblical Christianity. If you are not biblical in your practice and beliefs, you are not authentic, you are not correct, you are not accurate, you are not orthodox. <laughs> I'd like you to see what Paul said. In Galatians 1 and verse 8 to 9, concerning the gospel, I'd like you to see the emphasis he puts on scriptures, which also refers to some of the things that we said and some of the things that he also said. But though we, or an angel from heaven, everybody say an angel from heaven, angel. preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, so that which we have preached unto you is what is written. What is scriptures. It says if an angel or any other person or even us preach any other thing different, let the person be accursed. Verse 9, as we have said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. You know, I will soon show you why I'm stressing all these things. Because somebody can come up and say, this revelation, this rema I have, is not in scripture, but it's a rema. An angel showed me by 3 a.m. on December 14th, 1692. By 3 a.m., an angel came and taught me this thing. That's how Muhammad wrote the Quran. He said an angel dictated to him. So anybody can come up with, an angel said, so Paul said, even if an angel, or even if me, Let's assume I deviate from the scripture and I come and tell you something different. You know, we don't really pay attention to scripture like this. We say things like, my pastor said, more than we say the Bible said. Paul says, even if I say something that is contrary to scriptures, let me be accursed. None of us don't accept it. 
Hallelujah. So, we have to go back to biblical Christianity, put the emphasis on the scriptures. Jesus said it is written, Paul affirmed scriptures, we also should be doing the same thing. Now, the present um, challenge in our generation is that we don't really pay or we don't really see the scripture as an authority. Somebody says, well, why should I quote the Bible? Is the Bible not just another book? Why should I believe the Bible over the Quran? Why should I practice the Bible over 48 laws of power? Well, oh yeah, of course, because... <laughs> You know, anybody can claim to be an authority. When you're writing project, they'll say, cite your sources. Or reference your source. So when you write a project, you have to say, okay, in 1942, somebody did a research, and this is what the person came out. Don't just say, ethanol is not an alcohol. What's your source? Say, I just know. What's the meaning of I just know? Say, I know in my Noah. There's nothing like that. You must say, okay, according to this research, according to this discovery, this statement of fact holds and carries weight. But the problem is that many people who are believing or practicing Christians do not even see the scriptures as authority. Somebody says, well, the Bible says homosexuality is a sin. But, now when somebody says, but to scripture, you know he's saying that the Bible is not really the final authority. Are we still together here? Second Timothy to four and verse two to four, Paul told Timothy to preach this, preach the word in season and out of season. He says because there will come a time where they will no longer endure sound doctrine, and they would, you know, gather up teachers after their own lusts. So we have teachers who don't preach from the Bible, who claim to be authority, and their authority is God showed me. There have been a lot of interesting statements people have made. You know, and uh, when you ask them, why do you say something like this? They say something like, well, it's a rema. It's a revelation. I've heard things like, okay, sorry, may offend, your, may offend you, but let me just say it all the same. I'm just looking for an example. I'm not trying to target anybody. I've heard people say things like, Adam is not the first man. Uh, what's the source? That's the first question. What's the source? So if your source is out of scriptures, as a Christian, I'm supposed to run away. Amen. Amen. But in Nigeria, we do a lot of hero worship. The source is a man of God. A man of God said it. Man of God went there and born for 1989. I've been 1976. I've been 1942 or 1743. You know what we're talking about? Putting your words against an eternal book. But many people don't really see the scripture as final authority. That's why we are actually considering this subject, the canon of scripture. I will explain to you what that means and show you the implications. Hallelujah. Amen. If you are going to develop conviction in scriptures and you are going to embrace the scriptures as the final authority, you must investigate it. One of the ways you can respect someone is to investigate the person. If you investigate somebody, you are either going to disrespect him or respect him. What you find out will either be a source of conviction or a source of doubt. Are we still together here? So if you see me in church and I'm acting very holy, or you see me at home and I'm acting very filthy, after the investigation, you may not really respect me again and say, I know him now, he's just a pretender. He's two-faced. What he is in church is different from who he is at home. His values and his summons in church is not the same as his values and his summons at home. By your investigation, you would either disrespect me or respect me further. But if you investigate me and you don't see any death, you don't see any filth, you say, wow. Oh, wow. It's really clean. Hallelujah. Amen. There are people that EFCC cannot threaten in Nigeria. There's nothing on their name. <laughs> they can say anything. Nobody's going to call them and say, we have your record, though. Stop talking. Nobody is going to do that because their records are clean. But there are some people that any small investigation, <laughs> you know, one day <laughs> I was seeing some things on Facebook and I was very irritated. And it comes up like every five, five years. Somebody will say, Facebook tomorrow is going to release all your inbox. Copy and paste this thing on your status. 
Facebook does not have the permission to, to share any material that I have. And you're wondering, what are you hiding? Which is not true anyway. Facebook will never share your inbox. But for you to be afraid to come and post it and say, copy and paste, shared from, or forwarded from headquarters of Facebook or whatever your source is. You must be hiding something. When people are investigated or when something is researched, you are likely to respect that thing. If you don't research the scripture, if you don't investigate the scripture, you will not have convictions in the scripture. So Jesus said, search the scriptures. Many of us don't believe the Bible because we have not really researched it. You only carry the Bible around because your mother bought one for you. Some of you, if your mother did not buy a Bible for you, you know a Bible. And you respect portions of the Bible that your pastor speaks about. Portions that he never speaks about, you don't even know about it. You don't know where the book of Nahum is. You don't even know there's a book called Nahum. You have not searched the scripture. I can tell you some things in the Bible, and I'm very certain you will be like, that was a day, a day. Because you have not researched it, investigated it. Amen. Amen. So, search the scriptures. Because that's how you're going to get conviction. <laughs> that's how you're going to respect the scriptures. People who quote the constitution have searched the constitution. Amen. Amen. So, if you, you see, the reason why a lawyer is confident is because he knows what's in the book. What is being equal to? In Nigeria, by technicality, they can dismiss your case. Even if you actually are correct. But when somebody has researched, when somebody says go to court, it should be on the basis of, I've checked the book, I know what's there. I'm going to win. If you don't search the scriptures, you're not going to be confident in scriptures. Hallelujah. Yeah. The scripture is an open book. Many people actually, they, 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 they think that the way to respect the scripture is that they should not investigate it. I don't question it, don't investigate it, don't search it, just babe. Mm -mm. That's how we produce with Christians. Don't babe. If I say something and I quote a scripture, check it. Is it true? Is it correct? If I say, for instance, Balaam is described as a prophet, not just as a soothsayer, is it true? Is it true that Balaam wasn't just called false prophet, was actually called prophet? Is it true? Search it. Don't just take it because I said it. When you search it and you find it is true, you will respect it more. You say, okay, the Bible is correct, the Bible is accurate. Many of us cannot engage in debate with Muslims. Because Muslims, some Muslims have investigated the scripture more than Christians. They have searched, checked all the so-called contradictions. You don't know. So when they are quoting some worship, you say, hey, that, that one day, I don't know, and you're a Christian. So if you don't investigate it, you cannot respect it. Hallelujah investigate the scripture the bible is an open plain book because it is open for scrutiny it is not afraid the bible is not afraid of your investigation it's not afraid. so you don't have to now be say ah just let me just babe. no check check double check you see one of the reasons why the bible is a beautiful book is that it's not just a divine book it's also an historical document so you can you can people can do research and go and check are there ruins of the walls of Jericho? Is the Sodom and Gomorrah story a myth or an actual event? And is there any other historical record that confirms it? Do records such as fossil records, archaeological records, confirm that they, were used, they used to be giants in the land? You know? The, the Bible is, is, is an open book and you can compare it with other accurate historical books. So, search the scriptures, investigate the scriptures. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, let me begin to narrow on my emphasis tonight. The argument for our generation includes statements like, is the Bible really the word of God? We have said several things, including that the Bible it's not the word of God. It only contains the word of God. That's a very interesting statement. But many times it is not entirely true. Amen. Amen. But many people are doubting if the Bible is really the word of God. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, where we read, or where we were about to read before I changed the text, it says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The word inspiration of God means 
all scripture is breathed by God or is God breathed. So, the Bible claims to be the word of God. But aside from the Bible claim, is there any other proof that the Bible is the word of God? Who wrote the book of Moses of um, Genesis? Moses, right? Who wrote the book of, let me give you a tricky one, Acts? John, Paul. Luke. Luke, actually, okay? You can know by reading the first three verses of Acts and the first three verses of Luke. You see they were written to the same person and by the same person. Who wrote the book of Galatians? So we have Moses, we have Luke, we have Paul. Yet we say the Bible is the word of God. So 2 Timothy, 2 Peter rather, 1 and verse, 1 and verse 19 gives us an idea of how we make sense out of this truth. Go to verse 20 and 21, please. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but only men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. So Moses, Paul, Luke, they spoke and they wrote as they were moved by God. That's why we consider their writings or their speech as the word of God. The idea of all scripture is given by the inspiration of God means that the writings were by men or the writings were done by men who have agreed that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Is that not so? When was Moses born? Which book showed Moses' birth? Come on now, you should know that. Exodus. Exodus, is that not so? So Moses was able to capture Genesis because he wrote by the inspiration of God. And the phrase inspiration of God communicates God's influence on man to write. That influence could be several ways. For instance, some of the things that Moses wrote, God wrote it by himself. The Ten Commandments that Moses first broke, it was God that wrote it on a stone. It was God himself that wrote it. Amen. Amen. But subsequent other communications, God spoke to Moses. Moses wrote it down. And then passed it on to Israel. Whatever happened in Genesis must have been that Moses saw visions and revelations and he wrote it down too. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God does not mean there are no human involvement. It, however, means that this human involvement were not, they were not the major thing. It was God speaking and man documenting. Everybody say God speaking and man documenting. Okay, you will understand better as we proceed. Why we need to ask and answer the question, is the Bible really the word of God? Is because humans were involved in writing it. And there were many books that humans wrote on behalf of God that did not make it to the Bible. Amen. Amen. Are, the Bible has 66 books. And there are many books that were written and they claimed to be books inspired by God too. But they did not make it to the Bible. So we need to now ask ourselves, what is the standard for making it into the Bible. That's what we mean by canon. The word canon, C-A-N-O-N, is not talking about canon camera. What we use is a canon, is that not so? We use a canon, what? Now, this video camera is a canon. <laughs> what we mean by canon is in the Hebrew or in the Greek, a measuring rod. The measuring rod to determine if a book is qualified to be in this book of books called Bible or Scripture. This measuring rod is what we are trying to examine tonight. That's what we are calling it the canon of Scriptures. Because it's not like, when we say Bible, it's not like Exodus was written 
in heaven and then it was just dropped on the earth. Women's were involved. And there were many other women who were involved in many religious books. How come those books were discarded and only 66 made the cut off mark? What is the basis of the cut off mark? That's what we're talking about tonight the canon of scriptures. Like I said on Sunday, the Catholic Bible is bigger than the, let me say, um, what's the phrase now? Protestant Bible. <laughs> All of us are Protestants. <laughs> If you're not in the Catholic Church, a Protestant, that's the way it is actually. Um, so, they have some other books called Apocrypha. Um, I will mention a couple of them. We have Judith. By the way, there's a man of God, um, forgotten his name, he's a close friend to Apostle Arome, and they've been inviting themselves recently. David Ogule. He quotes a lot from the book of Enoch. Have you ever attended to read the book of Enoch before? You have, okay. Do you know that Jude quotes the book of Enoch? Okay, so, but the book of Enoch did not still make the Bible. Amen. Amen. Why? We have, to, we have to answer why. Why does a book as rich as Enoch such that even Jude quoted it, yet it does not make the Bible? What is the canon, measuring rod to determine what enters the Bible? Are we still together here? Yeah. Okay. Let me give you a few um, historical perspectives to how we arrived at these 66 books. For the Old Testament canon, what is canon? <laughs> to measure the books that were qualified for the Old Testament, it was not too controversial. The Jews um, always affirmed the canon of the law, the prophets, the psalms. And I'll show you from scriptures. Look at Luke 24, 44. That should give us a good clue. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you which I was, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in, echo it after me, the law, the prophets, the Psalms. So what we refer to as the law of Moses is the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, that's um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Is that not so? Yes, Let it be clear that in the, you see, the Old Testament was not divided. Like we have it now, book, chapters, verses. So you just have scrolls and parchments of the law. We also had scrolls and parchments of the prophets. Then we also had scrolls and parchments of the Psalms. Now, look at Jesus says, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you. So while Jesus was on the earth, he preached from the law of Moses. He preached from the prophets. He preached from the Psalms. And all of those three books we refer to as the scripture. Amen. Amen. Please, at this time, there was no Old Testament, New Testament. We just had the law, the prophets, the Psalms. And the Psalms included Proverbs and all the other wisdom books. So, for Old Testament um, canon, it was not really controversial. The Jews already agreed that, if you, in fact, that's why all their, all their activities was regulated by the law of Moses. When they met that woman who committed adultery, they said, it is written in the law of Moses. So they agreed that Moses' words were scripture. It carried the authority of God. Don't look at the cameraman. Look at me and I will chase you away. If, they are, if you are the church, maybe you are too fine. Your are cut. I'll chase you away. I'll, I'll, I will change you if you are distracting them. Uh, what was I saying? So, the Jews, for, for, for many of the Jews, there was no controversy. The book of Moses, the prophets, all of those books were quoted. In fact, when we're going to ask, where was the Messiah going to be born? They quoted, oh, in the book of so so prophets, it is written that we were born in this place. So, they all agreed that those books were not just books of men. They carry the authority of God. Hallelujah. 
a few other a few other affirmations to the canon of the old testament in john 10 35 we see jesus saying if he called them gods now where did we say the scripture is psalms put it in verse 34 to 35 Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God. If we call them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Let's find out where this is written. Hold on. Ye are gods, sons of the most high, is in Psalms. Psalm what? Let me confirm very quickly. If you are sure, raise, it, raise your volume now. Sorry, it's okay. 82 verse... Okay, Psalm 82 verse 6. So I said the phrase, what of us? Okay, I have said you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. Is this a psalm? Is this a psalm? Yes, sir. But what did Jesus say in John chapter 10? Put it there. What does he say? Is it not written in your law? That's what I'm saying. The phrase in your law is referring to general Old Testament writings. Are we clear? Yes. I said, ye are gods. Verse 35. Look at now the next statement. If he called them gods. If he called them gods. In the E he had small letter suggesting it's a woman being. Follow me closely. Are we still together? Yes, sir. But it is the woman documenta that is referring to. The inspiration is from God. Because it says, unto whom the word of God came. And the scripture cannot be broken. So Jesus equated the Psalms to scripture, equated the Psalms to the word of God. Are you following me here? So you can't read Psalms and say it's lamentation of David. Mm -mm. That's not how Jesus referred to the Psalms. It's, it's called word of God. And many Christocentric believers do these things. Say the prophet did not know what they were saying. Hi. Say one, 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 one man was just talking. It, it, that's not how Jesus referred to Psalms. So he says this scripture cannot be broken. He gave it an eternal relevance. Are you following me here? Yeah. So that's the same mentality you must have as a Christian. You cannot be reading Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and be thinking it's just a man talking. <laughs> it's scripture. This is the word of God that came. Glory to Jesus. Yeah. So Jesus affirmed that what is written in Psalms. What is written in the law? What is written in the prophets? Ah, scripture, the word of God. If you call them God, unto whom the word of God came. Look at another verse of scripture just to affirm this reality. Are you learning anything? John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. But the son of perdition, that the scripture may be fulfilled. So, there was a prophecy in the Psalms about the son of perdition that was going to be lost. And Jesus quoted or affirmed that the experience of him losing one apostle was because of a scripture in the Psalms that cannot be broken. And if you read that scripture, you may not even know it was actually talking about Judas Iscariot. It would sound like just a lamentation of David complaining about betrayal, but it was a prophecy of scripture about Judas who betrayed his master. Hallelujah. Amen. And then Jesus now referenced it and said, as the scripture said it or for the sake of the fulfillment of the scripture. So Jesus affirmed the fact that the scripture must be fulfilled. Now, once you see that the scripture might be fulfilled, it means that the word was a word of God. Because it's only the word of God that has that kind of weight that it must be fulfilled. Amen. Any other word does not carry that kind of authority. So when God says something, it must be fulfilled. It may take one billion years, but it must be fulfilled. Because it's the word of God. Hallelujah. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? Why would Jesus 
quote the scripture to people who argue with him because they already agreed that the scripture is the final. Do you understand me? If I go to a Nigerian court and I quote the constitution of Nigeria, it's because I have agreed, the court has agreed, the judge has agreed that the constitution is the final say. If not, why do you quote it as a defense? If there's no agreement that that's the final say. So in quoting scriptures, Old Testament prophets, law, Psalms, Jesus was simply affirming that the scripture with the words of God. Are we together now? Okay. Now, one or two other emphasis in this direction to justify the canon of the Old Testament is a Jewish historian, Josephus. Josephus is well, he is a Christian. Let me say he was a Christian. And, uh, but, of course, he was given to a lot of historical research. And the sources he cited were not Christian. The sources he cited were historical facts. So Josephus could quote people that existed in the Roman Empire, in the Babylonian Empire, to affirm that all the things the Bible wrote about Babylon in the days of Daniel, in the days of Isaiah, were actually true events, not just visions and fables. So, Josephus, Josephus is a respected historian, not just a respected Christian. And so his historical sources affirm that the books in the Old Covenant or the Old Testament um, were accepted as the words of God. Are we still together now? Yes, Let's progress to the more controversial issue, which is the New Testament books. Um... It's a little bit more complicated, so I need to give you some historical background. One of the reasons why the concept of the canon of scriptures was established concerning the, Old, concerning the New Testament was because of heretics that rose up. One of them in particular, we spoke about him in passing in the first series of church history. We spoke about the man called Marcion, or Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N. He was given to Gnostic teachings and so some of his perspectives about life and about scriptures were perverted. I will explain thoroughly because I know many of you did not even witness that first initial teaching but I will encourage you to get that sermon. It's titled Early Heresies and Heretics. So I think the third teaching of the church history series. Are we still together? In AD 140, this Marcion guy showed up and he was very, very loud. Because of his exposure to wrong teachings, he began to teach that the God of the Old Testament was different from the God of the New Testament. I have to admit that many of his kinds have evolved and they are still preaching today. Many people talk about the God of the Old Testament like it's a different God from the God of the New Testament. That was a Mr. Marcion philosophy. He thought that the Old Testament God was full of anger and vengeance and the author of evil. And this God was only interested in the Jewish nation and he was prepared to destroy all other nations. And you must have answers to questions like, why is your God so wicked? He commanded Israel to be killing Amalekites, Philistines. Why? You must have answers. And you must say, it is written. You must not say Wikipedia. You must say, it is written. Amen. Amen. Some of you are already shaking your head because you cannot, you cannot answer me. If I ask you why. You know when God said, go and kill the Amalekites, I hope you know children were involved. Hello? Children were involved too. So some people now say, no. The God that said Amalekite should be killed was an angel. <laughs> I was trying to explain to one of our members today. And she was asking me that she was saying that in her church she was taught that God does not kill and God cannot kill. And that it was angels that killed. I said, okay, what is the rationale behind that? And she said, since killing is sinful, God cannot do sin. I said, okay, that's quite a very interesting perspective. Let, let me ask you, if you wash your hand, do you know what happens when you wash your hand to bacteria? Do you know what happens? You don't know? Like one million bacteria has died when you wash your hand. One million bacteria. Imagine the bacteria that say, 
murderer. <laughs> Akpayo. But that's how we sound when we say some things to God. God, God, God will just use us to catch crews. <laughs> they say I'm a murderer because I killed Amalekites. Meanwhile, I was only doing clean up exercise. I was cleaning up. Ah. You, you need to know many things, not from human perspective. If not, you'll be among those saying, God, you're a killer. And God, angels will sit down and laugh. So I was explaining to why I said, you know, people that say God does not kill, they believe that God was, who, who, who sent manna from heaven? God or angels? God. Okay, okay. Who, who divided the Red Sea? God or angels? Who brought water out of the rock? God or angels? Who killed the first of the Egyptians? Angels, I mean. You say reason now. <laughs> you see, you can't, you, 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 you don't, don't, sometimes in a bit to defend God, people sound stupid. You sound, you actually sound stupid. And you see the consistency of scriptures. Okay, let me show you, for instance, I just need to tidy this up because this is a very important um, conversation and we are talking about the canon of scriptures and maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe in our generation, Many, many people are quick to believe that the New Testament is the word of God, but don't agree that the Old Testament is the word of God. I think that's... So maybe I should stress this a bit. And it's human logic, it's humani humanistic teachings that bring us to this point. Look at it in Psalms. And I'd like you to see Psalm 136 and verse 10. So you cannot, you cannot say Jesus quoted the Psalms and the one he quoted with scriptures, but the other Psalms are not scriptures. Mm -mm. Hello. You cannot say Jesus said ye are gods. He quoted it from the Psalms. That is, he gave authority to the words of the Psalms. And then every other Psalm, you dismiss it. So him that smote Egypt in their firstborn for his mercy and yours. What is the reaction to him smiting Egypt and their firstborn? His mercy and yours. You may not like it, but fix it. God is not your mate. It's a man who always says that on Twitter. Peace out. You say, God is not your, you may not understand it, but God is not your mate. And the bacteria may say, he, he, he washed his hand and killed us, one million of us. But it's because the bacteria is overrating itself. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying equating the value of human life to bacteria. I'm trying to let you know that. Sometimes, when, you, when your perspective is limited, you will say some funny, funny things. Okay. I've deviated, so let me go back to my emphasis. I was talking about this Marcion guy, or Marcion guy, who was talking about old... Now, so, because Marcion believed and taught that the God of the Old Testament was given of the New Testament, he now denounced every book of the Old Covenant. He said it's not good. Nobody should read it. And people who followed him also practiced that. He rejected the entire Old Testament writings and every New Testament writing that had a seeming, reduce the volume, sir, it's still loud, a seeming Jewish background. For instance, James. You know, James sounds very legalistic. Say, so don't you know that faith without works is dead? Don't you know that Abraham was justified by works? Now, James talking. <laughs> Abraham was justified by works, yeah. by faith that works. So he removed Peter, James, and any other book that had a seeming Jewish bias. Matthew, Mark, Hebrews, Acts. He removed them. The only book he was left with is half of Luke. Because even from Luke, he had to remove. Yeah, you can start, see? And yeah, when you want to, when you reject the authority of scriptures, you will be cherry picking. That's, why is people cherry picking? <laughs> no, we have gotten there. So it's not you accept everything or leave everything. If, because once you say this one is not scripture, okay, there are many other ones too. So you can, it's not, you can, you, you have to be consistent. Are you following me here? If you, either you accept all of scripture, say expression of God, all scripture is given by the inspiration. If you don't arrive at that point of Second Timothy three sixteen, you will you will enter the error of ah this one is scripture, this other one is not scripture. This one is word of God. This other one is one of word of men. Many of those things. Okay. 
So Marcion only kept the ten letters of Paul and half of the book of Luke, and that was his own Bible. He had a very interesting vibe for Paul. He basically idolized Paul. <laughs> and that's why when you see people in a bit to sound New Testament, always say, or always put an emphasis, in fact, an overemphasis on Paul's letters. Be careful. All scripture, not Paul's letters. All scripture. Even in the Corinthian church, some people say, I am for Paul. I am for Peter. Even people that said, some people said, I am for Christ. They too, they are wrong because they are just taking sides with their bias. All scripture. Paul saw, or rather, Machion saw Paul as the greatest enemy of the law and a great spokesman for the gospel. In fact, he considered him the supreme figure in the church. Machion believed that Christ descended from heaven only twice. First, at the incarnation, and secondly, to teach Paul the revelation of the gospel. Machion believed that Jesus ascended to sit down at the right hand of God, and Paul also ascended to sit down at the right hand of Jesus. That's how Machion believed Paul was. That's why Paul said in Galatians 1, even if me come and teach anything contrary to scripture, let me be accursed. You see, even Paul knew that someone would come in his name and say, eh, Paul, Agba, Agba, gospel teacher. Agba. Any other person, no, 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 maker. And many people say, I'm Pauline. My theology is Pauline. Pauline, huh? <laughs> Idolatry. You see, <laughs> yeah, I do idolatry. The, 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 the beauty of Christianity is in its wholeness. And there were certain things Paul could not, or Paul did not communicate. Peter communicated it. I thank God for the book of Jude. Oh, I thank God for the book of James. I thank God for the books of Peter. Because some, some, there were many things that, because of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles, he did not emphasize. Peter, Jude, James emphasized it. Hallelujah. Amen. Anyway, Machion was eventually excommunicated from the church. But people followed him a lot, so he had his own version of Christianity. And the church had to now sit down and have a meeting with respect to what books are going to be accepted and what books are going to be rejected. And so they agreed. The Old Testament was part of the Bible alongside the book of Paul, the books of Paul and other authors that were apostolic. James, Peter. It took a while for some of the books to come to be accepted. Like Revelations, Hebrews. For Hebrews, it was because we didn't know the author. I was going to show you one of the measuring rod is to confirm who wrote it. If we don't know who wrote it, we can't be sure. We'll leave it. So, some of those books were not easily circulated. So, they were not really accepted at first. But subsequently, by the time we got to the third century of church history, what we have now was accepted generally as biblical books, the scriptures. Amen. Amen. Beyond this Machion guy, Machion helped the church to include the Old Testament in the Bible. Because of his heresies, the church went full, should I say, they went full force in emphasizing the Old Testament. But there was another heretic that helped in what is called the closure of the canon. Montanus. I also spoke about him in Early Heresies and Heretics. His name is Montanus. When we say closure of canon, we have another problem. If the scripture is the word of God and the word of God was inspired by the Holy Ghost, why can't I, in 2023, be inspired by the Holy Ghost and it should be included in the Bible. So, we have the concept of the canon. We also have the concept of a closed canon. That is, antipathy is here. Full stop. We are not adding anything here. But why that happened was because Montana and his two 
women. Let me look for their names here. Maximila and Prisca. They were very, let me use the word, spiritistic people. They used to prophesy God. The problem was not prophecy. As early as, or even later down in church history, supernatural utterances were accepted. The problem was that many of their prophecies were not aligning to scripture. The philosophy of Montana was that he said, the New Testament replaced the Old Testament. He said it like this. The law was replaced by the words of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And he used the Sermon on the Mount to explain it. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, yep, Jesus said, it is written, or, um, how did he put it now, in Matthew 5. You have heard, but I say. You have heard, an eye for an eye, but I say. Love your enemies. Do you understand that? So Montana said, okay, since Jesus' words have replaced the Old Testament words, when Jesus left, he left it to the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit can also replace Jesus' words. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's why you must not also say things like, Jesus replaced the Old Covenant. Jesus fulfilled is a better way. I know this small, small um, terminologies can make a whole lot of difference. When Jesus came, he said, I did not come to destroy the law. <laughs> I came to fulfill it. So, this replacement theology, Jesus replaced Moses, Holy Spirit replaced Jesus. Mm. That's what Montana said. And Montana said, the Holy Ghost was inspiring to say many things that were not in scriptures. So, they chased him away too from the church. The complicated he and uh, Prisca and Maximila. I like the name Maximila. I like it. Max. You don't want us to name Max Miller. <laughs> Just sounds very posh. <laughs> I'm tired of getting being paid. <laughs> give me some interest. Give me the way if I call him like this. If, I, if, if you go bank and say, What's your name? Max Miller. They'll put some extra respect to you. Max Miller. <laughs> Okay, so now Montana also said that anybody that did not accept his prophecy was blaspheming against the Holy Ghost and committing the unpardonable sin. So they chased him away. <laughs> and they also agreed that they must have a closure of the canon. Beyond establishing the books in the Bible, we must also establish that there are no further additions. Is that taken? So all of this gives an historical perspective as to how we arrived, how church elders, and we need to respect the labors of church elders. Now somebody says, eh, church elders, I don't know human beings too. Well, let me say this. It's not like the church elders decided the books that were going to be in scripture. Follow me. They didn't decide it. The books that fit into scripture have already been decided by God. They only discovered it. Hello? They only discovered it. It's not like you, I don't want to determine. It's not like the elders of the church, I don't want to determine. I say, eh, we like Paul, let's give him 10 books. Peter, you know, like, I give him only two books. Jude, the guy, you know, today, you know to get him only one book. That's not how it happened. There were many things they looked at, but whatever they were looking at were just confirmations of what was already obvious. And I said, well, it's, it meets this criteria, it fits into this criteria. It's just like an exam, an exam compiler. It, it, it's not the one that determines who crosses over and does not cross over. You write the exam, what you wrote determines whether you cross or not. Then we now, what we are marking, we now discover if what you wrote affirms that you should go to the next level or you should repeat. Do you understand the logic? Okay, but um, there are two scriptures I want, to, I want you to see that affirms the canon of New Testament writings. Second Peter three sixteen. Now this is Peter speaking concerning a man. We will soon see the man is talking about. But let's start from verse fifteen so we can see early enough. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul. Everybody say, Brother Paul. Brother Paul. 
also according to the wisdom given unto him as written unto you. As also in all his epistles, everybody say epistles. Listen now, now, this is where it gets a bit dicey. Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they are, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or argue or criticize, as they do also other scriptures. Now, what Peter was saying is that the words of Paul in his epistles carry the same authority as other scriptures. Other scriptures in this context could mean the prophets, the law, the Psalms. Do you follow? So Peter was invariably saying, the same way, you know, he used the word other scriptures. That means Paul's epistles were scriptures. Do you get the logic? Follow. He didn't say, he didn't just say scriptures, he says order. So when he says order, he's talking about Paul's scriptures and other statements referred to as scriptures. And he's putting them in the same bracket. Do you get the logic? So somebody cannot say, no, that was what Paul said. Mm -mm. Paul's words were scripture. Inspired by God. And then Paul also, <laughs> maybe in his arrogance also affirmed it. Sorry, not arrogance. Maybe in his confidence. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. 2 13, First Thessalonians. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which he heard of us, listen, you received it not as the word of men, but as in truth the word of God. So Paul says, when I came to preach the Thessalonian church, I preached, I was the one preaching, I was the one talking, but they did not receive it as the word of men. And actually they were correct, because it was actually the word of God. So Paul referred to his words as the word of God. Do you agree now? Okay. But about four or five other affirmations to the canon of the New Testament and even the canon of every other scripture or every other book in the Bible. What is canon? So, this is how we measured whether a book was supposed to fit or was, was belonging to the Bible. First is the transforming power of that book. Has the book transformed any life? If we say a book is inspired by God, it shouldn't just inform, it shouldn't just educate, it should transform. So when they were trying to examine which book is fitting for the Bible or which book fits into the scripture, they checked the transforming power of the book. In church history, we have read severally of, heard severally of many people who just heard the scripture and became saved. They heard the scripture, they heard the quotation, and they became saved because that scripture was not just the word of men. Even though it might have been the book of Romans, the book of Thessalonians written by Paul, but it carried the signature of God, the breath of the Holy Ghost, and so it was able to transform. This applies also when you want to judge a man of God's ministry, check the transforming power of that ministry. Hello? If it converts sinners into saints, it is of God. It may be controversial. You may not like it. There may be some, as it were, in the context of our present conversation, men of God of our times. It may not be perfect, but if there's transforming power, it's of God. So, they checked if it had any transforming power. If people had read it and became saved, became convicted, became healed, and once that book met up that standard, they included it in the Bible. Then, authoritative author. If the person who wrote the book is a prophet, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Moses, oh, it's accepted. What Moses said, ah, yeah, it's accepted. Because the concept is that prophets were messengers of God and received direct revelation from God. And so, if a prophet said something, the prophet was speaking as the mouthpiece of God. So, for the Old Testament books, once they confirmed it was a prophet's letter or a prophet's writing, they said it is certainly part of the Word of God. For the New Testament books, once they confirmed it was an apostol, apostolic writing, then it was part of you know, the books that was referred to as the Word of God. 
Now, we have people like Luke, who were not apostles, and even Mark. Now, so if somebody is not an apostle, but he was a very close person to an apostle, like the personal interpreter of an apostle, and he wrote something, his book was referred to as reliable. It is scripture. Are we still together here? So, um, the authoritative power, or rather, the, the, if the author was somebody of authority, if Paul writes something, well, you can say, Paul is a servant of God, we can respect it as scripture. But beyond what the direct apostles and prophets wrote, if somebody who was very close to them also wrote that book, it was also affirmed as scripture. That's why some people began to lie. What they did was that they would say, this is the fourth book of Paul to the Thessalonian church. Meanwhile, it was them that wrote it, it was not Paul. Because they knew that once it is written as the book of Paul, people will accept it. Do you, do you understand me now? So. Then they also checked if what was written fitted the character and nature of God as consistently emphasized throughout scriptures. That's why anybody who keeps talking about God, 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 love, 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 and does not talk about justice, which is emphasized, especially in the Old Covenant. In fact, all through scriptures, God's justice is emphasized. You know that the person is not really whole. And it's probably because he's in the order of Machion. If the writing does not fit into the character and nature of God as revealed in other scriptures, it is not fitting to be part of the Bible. One of the reasons why the apocrypha books were rejected, some of them contained conversations that did not fit in. For instance, some of those books suggested demons could be chased away through incense, which had no bearing in the prophets, the law, the Psalms. So what is the source? Some of them also add stories. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll probably mention that as the last thing here. I'm almost done. Are we still together here? Yes, sir. One last point in this direction. Fourth canon principle. Was it accepted by other saints? Was the book, was the letter accepted by other saints? Now, yeah, saints are women. They also make mistakes. But the thing with history is that God worked with people and ensured that the truth did not the truth was not hidden so if a book was written and then disciples of Paul rejected the book disciples of Peter rejected the book you can begin to suspect that book what's in the book why are, they, why are the saints of God rejecting it are we still together yes, come on are we still together yes, I'm almost done please I'm almost done um, one of the ways you can test a false prophet is to check the people that embrace his ministry. Are you following me? Yes, and that's why false prophets often want to farm with true prophets. Many false prophets, their tactics is that they go and take picture with the true man of God and say, my brother in the law. Because they know that the principle of discernment is that if he's accepted by the saints, it means that he's good. If he's rejected by the saints, so when you see man of God in isolation, he's a man of God, but doesn't relate with any other man of God, he's an apostle of his own. The kind of remark he shares, no other person can discover it. So nobody invites him to preach, he doesn't invite anybody to preach. Hmm. You can begin to put a question mark. If the saints rejected a letter or a book, then they said, since the saints did not accept it, it's not going to be part of the scriptures. Okay, let me say one last thing with respect to the apocrypha books and them. Um, we'll be done here. Now, the, the, the word apocrypha books could mean a couple of things, but dominantly they mean about 15 books written between Malachi and Matthew. What they record, now, it's not all these books it's not all the books in the Apocrypha that are necessarily evil or wrong. Some of them are not even close to evil or wrong. 
but let me just explain. Many of them were more historical than inspirational. And um, if what you are doing is just documenting history, you can do that without even being saved. When we say all scriptures given by the inspiration of God, we are saying even in historical ac accounts, they were inspirations from God. Acts is an historical book. It explains the early church, the post-resurrection event. But you can, you, when you read it, you'll be inspired. You won't just, it's not just reading history, like secular history. You see the elements of God in, God's influence in the book. Are we still together here? Yeah? So, some of these books, like Second Maccabees, or First and Second Maccabees, Tobit. By the way, this issue of um, Machion, it's not really Machion, I have to be very fair to Machion. Even Martin Luther, I taught you this, he removed the book of James from his own Bible. <laughs> the great Martin Luther, the father of Reformation. And everybody can fall into this pit, really. That's why these days I'm a bit soft when I see people who are criticizing some Bible guys. I just say, ah, you two have caught the virus. He gets well soon. <laughs> gets get well soon. And it can happen to anybody, really. <laughs> so, some of them, okay. The apocrypha includes some specific Catholic doctrines such as purgatory and prayer for the dead. Some people are still praying for Mubad. I say, oh, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's Catholic doctrine that teaches these things. And they got it from these apocryphal books. Are we still together? Yes, now, but let it be clear that the Jews, one of the reasons why we don't accept the apocrypha as scripture, what is scripture? The word of God, basically. Are we together? Yes, the Jews never accepted apocrypha as scripture. Because Christianity is strongly rooted in Jewish roots. Anything the Jews reject, especially Jewish Christians, put a question mark on it. Are we still together? Yes, because none of the apocryphal books were quoted by other books that were referred to as scripture. Only in Hebrews, the Hebrews chapter 11 account, where you see some heroes of faith. Some of those accounts were written in those apocryphal books, but that was the only time you see other scripture referencing apocryphal books. The divine statement, thus says the Lord, does not also appear in, many of those, in all the apocryphal books. In the prophets, you see, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord, which showed that it was not just man talking, it was God. The apocryphal books did not say, thus says the Lord. So we can't accept it as scripture. Are we still together? Now, remember I said the apocryphal books were books written between Malachi and Matthew. Church or, um, let me say, church history suggests that that period was a time of silence. There's a scripture between Malachi and Matthew. It looks like God was not talking. Now, there's a scripture that, oh boy, I did not write it. Let me... Let me skip it. I could easily search for it, but let me skip it. But Jesus, okay, Matthew 23, 35. Let me confirm. Matthew 23, 35. All right, good. That upon ye may, now follow closely. I know it's a bit academic, but follow closely. That upon ye may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. So we have Abel to Zacharias. The question is, why did Jesus stop at Zacharias? Now, of course, in the chrono chronological order, it looks like Malachi is the last person. But by virtue of existence, Zacharias was actually the last. Why did Jesus stop at Zacharias? Because Jesus was seemingly affirming that after Zacharias, the Old Testament canon was closed. And then the other person that spoke did not speak as inspired by God. Are you following me? Yes, so Abel was like the first prophet or the first speaking voice. <laughs> and then to Zacharias. Another, another suggestion could be that um, Abel was murdered, Zacharias was murdered. But it, this, this is not too um, emphatic. This 
theory I'm proposing is not too emphatic, but it suggests, Jesus was saying, it's, the speakings began from Abel and ended at Zechariah. So the books written after Zechariah, many of them are also referred to as apocryphal books. And many of them say a lot of interesting things, some of them historical interesting things. Some of them even try to describe the childhood of Jesus. Say when Jesus was five years old, one day he carried tomato and turned it to lion. You read many of those things in those apocryphal books. They are very interesting, but they are not too safe for consumption. Because nobody quoted them. Peter did not quote apocryphal books. James did not quote them. Paul did not quote them. So why, why would they be quoted by the Christian? Are you following me? One of the reasons why Enoch's, the book of Enoch was a bit controversial was that Enoch emphasized revelation. <laughs> and I don't blame him. He was a very weird man. For God to take him. <laughs> Enoch must have been living there. Enoch must have been visiting heaven every day. We just go. He said, oh, in Jamaica, on a day, we'll come back. So when he wrote, so what this we say? He just say, let's not add him. Even though... <laughs> But many people are beginning to read this book and preach from it, which I would say um, is a little bit controversial because if you begin to add Enoch, we begin to add other books too. And before you know it, the canon will be open again. So let's stay with the 66. Amen. Amen. Everything you need is in the 66. Everything you ever need in life. Christianity has been 66 books for the last how many years? One, two thousand, over 2,000 years. And we have survived well. So we don't need any special remark. Amen. Amen. Some of the books referred to as um, apocryphal books also. Well, the, some of them are called pseudo pseudophigrapha, which means false writings. Those are the books that people will now steal the names of prominent authors. They will say third letter of Paul. Me, when I write them, his name is Judah. We say third letter of Paul, but. Uh, you can't be smarter than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit exposed many of those things and um, trust them where they belonged. 